Hi guys, we're talking about the chapter of light. Uh, the light chapter syllabus is the same for pure physics and combined physics. So if you are any of those streams, you can watch the entirety of this video and everything will be tested. Right, uh, the light chapter is a relatively big chapter uh, encompassing reflection, refraction, total internal reflection, also known as TIR, refraction by lenses and ray diagrams uh, for lenses. Now, um, let's talk about why we are able to see things. Now, um, the reason why we are able to see things is that light from a certain object or from a certain source is being released and entering our eyes. That's why we are able to see it. Now, objects where it gives off its own light, we call them luminous objects. Now, for objects that do not give off their own light, like a picture or the wall or the table, uh, all these fall under the category of what we call non-luminous objects. Now, the way we can see non-luminous objects is that light ray from a certain um, from a luminous object must reach, hit the non-luminous object, bounce off of it, and and then enter our eye. That is the reason we are able to see a non-luminous object. If there's no light, then actually we are not able to see any non-luminous object. Now, uh, in terms of color, how are we able to see color? So I've highlighted this portion here, green. Now, the reason we see green is because the light from the light lamp above me is reaching here this white light and everything else is being absorbed except for the color green the green is being reflected back out into the lens and that's why I see the color green here the reason why this region is black is because all the light that is coming from the lamp is being absorbed and none is being given out so that's why this region looks black to us now uh, light travels in a straight line uh, how do we know light travels in a straight line? Uh, imagine you are sitting in a cubicle, a toilet cubicle, and you have closed the door. Right? The, a person outside cannot see you in the cubicle because the light rays are traveling straight and uh, they are bouncing off you, are traveling straight uh, and being blocked by the door. That's why I cannot see. But if light travels in a straight line, uh, does not travel in a straight line, then actually in theory the light can curve and then the light from you can actually reach the person outside. So in theory this person can see if the light ray is not traveling in a straight line. But that doesn't happen in real life. So we know this is definitely not true. So we know light travels in a straight line. Alright, so because we know light travels in a straight line, we represent it with straight lines. Just draw a straight line and to indicate the direction of where the light ray is traveling, we draw an arrow here. Alright, uh, a few terms that you may need to be familiar with. Uh, light rays that are parallel to one another are called parallel light rays. Light rays that meet at one point are called converging light rays. Light rays that come out from a certain point are called diverging or divergent light rays. Now, let's look at the next slide. Uh, is there anything wrong with this diagram? Uh, yes, there is. Lah. Right, uh, the reason is that actually what is wrong is actually the arrow heads are pointing towards the apple. Uh. So for a person to see the light, uh, to see the apple, the light ray actually must be coming from the apple and going into the person's eye. That's why you can see. So we just take note. Now, there are two laws of reflection that you need to know. Alright, uh, the first one sounds very wordy. So I'll just run through in a little bit more detail. The first law of reflection states that the incident ray the reflected ray, the normal, all lie in the same plane only at one point and that point is called a point of incidence. Now, it sounds like it's really, really a lot of words to, for me to introduce. So let me just briefly run through with you what first law means. If any light ray hits a surface, we call the light ray that hits the surface the incident ray. Now, we define, we define the angle between this incident ray and the normal that is drawn to the surface here as the angle of incidence. Alright, in a reflection question, the light ray will bounce off in this direction. The light ray that bounces off is called the reflected ray. And the angle between the reflected ray and the normal is called the angle of reflection. Now, later on, we'll talk about the second law. The second law basically just states that the angle of incidence must equal to the angle of reflection. Now, if you are able to draw this diagram, then actually you have already stated that you know first law. Because the first law states 
the incident ray, which is this fella, the reflected ray, which is this fella, and the normal, which is the normal line here, all lie on the same plane, which is this line here, this plane here, only at one point, and that point is called the point of incidence. The point where it hits the mirror. So this is called the point of incidence. Alright, so if you're having troubling are having trouble with trying to remember the first law, just remember this diagram. The second law is a bit more simpler. The angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection in a reflection question. Now, um, that is basically all there is about reflection, but um, the complication comes in how they ask the questions. So, let's look at this. Uh, o level type questions, they have a tendency to sometimes trick you. So they may only give you this angle without any of this other information here. Normal not included, reflected ray also not included. So when they ask you angle of reflection, then you are supposed to actually draw the normal down first and identify that this is the angle of incidence, which is 60 degrees. And therefore, by second law, you know the angle of reflection is also 60 degrees. And then you can answer the question. Right? Some other ways in which they can complicate things even further, they can give you two mirrors. And then it's basically just playing around with your geometry. Lah. So if they give you a light ray is incident at 30 degrees, then you're supposed to know the angle of incidence here is 60. By second law, you know this is also 60, and therefore you know this is also 30, because the normal line is 90 degrees, 90 degrees here. Because you know this is 30, and you draw the line, and the angle here, let's say, is given as 80, you know 80, 30, the interior sum of triangle must be 180. So this is 80, this is 30, this is 70 and because you know this is 70 and this is the point of incidence here if you draw a normal you know that the angle of incidence is then 20 degrees which then gives you the final angle of reflection off of surface dc as 20 degrees right so just take note they just they can complicate things a little bit lah. now um all surfaces will reflect like except for surfaces that are black lah. then they just absorb everything lah. right but the depending on the surface then we have different type of reflection. Like if you look at the table down here, why is it if you look at the table here, you cannot see your face? Right? The reason is because uh, it, there is reflection going on, but the reflection is called an irregular or diffuse reflection. Right? This is what happens when you have a mirror. Right? The reflection comes super nicely in and leaves super nicely out so that you can see your face nicely. Right? Over here, the light rays all come parallel but then they move out in all different directions. And because of this, you cannot really see a good image form. All right, so I'll give you an example of how it looks like. All right, so over here, I have an image of Mount Fuji being reflected off the surface. Uh, this was taken on a trip when I went to Japan, and you can clearly see the reflection of Mount Fuji in the surface of the lake here, lah, the water. All right, uh, a few minutes later, I took another picture, and then you actually can't really see Mount Fuji here. Right, uh, you can of course clearly see the difference. The difference is that this surface here of the lake is much calmer than over here, lah. Right, so what happened is that the family of ducks came out and they started splashing around, and then actually the wind also started to pick up. So the surface didn't become uh, became disturbed, and they didn't it wasn't as smooth as this surface. That's why over here regular reflection is happening, but over here diffuse reflection is happening. There's still light from Mount Fuji coming out. And being reflected but they are reflected in all different directions that's why you don't have a nice reflection being formed here all right we're back to over here so smooth surfaces will give you a nice regular reflection rough surfaces they will also reflect but they don't reflect well enough to give you a nice reflection um, does it mean I'm breaking the law of second law of reflection if you look at it I come in all together and then they bounce off at different directions as because of uh, no I'm not breaking the second law I'm not violating the second law of reflection over on each of this bumpy surface if you can see the rough surface all right, you will see that actually because of the surface the normal to the surface is all different so the normal to this light ray here is this but if I'm looking at this light ray here the normal because of the direction is actually over here Alright, and then if you look at the first light ray over here, the one that's coming over here, then because of the curvature of the surface, my normal is actually over here. So individually, they all still uh, obey the second law of reflection. It's just that when they are all over the place, then uh, you don't get a nice reflection. Uh, one way in which you can change this to this is polishing. 
So that's why sometimes in the army, they make you polish your boots and then become very shiny. What you're doing is you're actually filling in the gaps here. You fill in the gaps here, make it a smooth surface so then regular reflection can occur. Alright, so now we talk about images in the plane mirror. Uh, I'm sure you can read this quite easily. Uh, it says physics is fun. Alright, um, you see these kind of things uh, on the ambulances. So if you look at the ambulance head on directly, you will see the word ambulance is actually uh, flipped left to right, right to left. Alright, the reason is because images that are formed in mirrors uh, actually will be inverted or rather we call it laterally inverted. The left becomes right, the right becomes left. Lah. And the word ambulance to somebody who is in a car and the ambulance is behind him and he's looking in the mirror, he will see the ambulance word being formed correctly. Lah. Alright, so I have a short video. I'll link the video for you lah, so later you all can have a look at it. Alright, so I just need you to observe the video and then tell me what you can see about the images that are formed in the mirror. Alright, so the video is a mirror prank. I'm just going to play it. Alright. So what they have is actually this girl has a twin lah. And then this is actually a second room behind here lah. Uh, that's why this girl looks very shocked that she doesn't have her reflection. Alright, so just have a look at it. Now a few things I want you to take note of this uh, while I pause it. Uh, this is how a reflection works lah. So if this is the real person here, oh sorry, if this is the real person here, then you can see that when the person is actually sticking out the right hand, the reflection on this side is actually sticking out the left hand. Alright, so this is what we talk about when we talk about the ambulance, left become right, right becomes left, it's called lateral inversion. Alright, later I'll, I'll show you the notes for it. Um, we'll go back to this slide here. Uh, uh, some other characteristics you will notice lah. The, uh, while the image may be laterally inverted, it's not fully inverted. Fully inverted means the up become down and the down become up as well lah. So obviously it doesn't, it, that's not true because the head of the lady is here and the reflection is also here lah. Alright, uh, some other characters, characteristics is that uh, it is also uh, same size of the object. So whatever you see here, the lady here, the image should also be the same size. and. We also talk about something called image distance equals to object distance. So the distance from the mirror here to the lady here, the object, is the same distance as the mirror here to the where the image is being formed. So image distance here is equals to object distance here on the other side of the mirror. Alright, so these are some characteristics of an image formed in a plane mirror. It is laterally inverted. Um, I'm going to have to ask you to memorize this because it is important. It's the same size as the object. It is upright, meaning it's not inverted. Up is not down, down is not up, meaning up is still up, down is down. So this is upright. Um, it is virtual. Later on, we'll explore a little bit more about what virtual means in lenses. But the gist of it is that it isn't really there and it cannot be captured on the screen. Lah. All right. uh, this one is a bit mouthful, but later on, uh, it's just basically saying that the image distance is equal to object distance. All right. Now, there are a few steps that you need to uh, deal with when you are drawing uh, images or drawing ray diagrams for plane, plane mirrors. Lah. So, uh, basically, we summarize them to th three steps. Lah. The first step is uh, locate the image first. Lah. So, step one is locate image. And you locate the image by using one of the properties that is object distance is equals to image distance. Lah. Right. So, if you look at this, uh, if the object is over here in front of the mirror, then the image will actually be from the same distance behind the mirror. Lah. You need to draw a normal line to the surface connecting to the object so that you can identify the distance and then it will be from the exact same distance behind the mirror. Alright, step two is actually to draw the reflected ray. So now that you have located the image, you are supposed to use a ruler to connect the image to the eye. Sometimes they may ask you to draw two lines. Sometimes they may just ask you to draw one line. But basically the essence is I just connect the image to the eye. Because the eye or the observer, he sees where the image is. Uh, he, he, the brain tells him that the image is being formed here. So he, you draw and you connect from the eye towards the image. Now, uh, please note that the light rays at the back of the mirror should be dotted lines because they don't really exist. So then you connect, make sure you draw here. So the step two is actually to draw the reflected ray and you do that by connecting the image to the eye. So step two, image, image to eye. 
Alright, step three is then to connect the object to the point of incidence on the mirror. Alright, so once you are able to do that, then you have formed the proper diagram of the ray diagram. Lah. Then actually you don't even have to draw the normal here because the I and the R will definitely be correct. Alright, so a few things to take note. I'll illustrate this with an example immediately after this. Uh, but basically, if I have an object here and I have a mirror here, then the image will form over here. The observer will still see the image here even though there is no mirror here. Alright, so let's just see. And how do we solve these kind of questions then? How do I know where the image forms? So what you do is actually you extend the mirror line. You draw a line, dotted line, perpendicular to the surface. And you measure this distance here, D1. Once you have measured this distance, reproduce it on the other side, D1 as well. Indicate that's where the image is. Then you connect from the observer in a straight line to the image, make sure behind the mirror is dotted line. This is the light ray bouncing off the reflected ray. Then you connect it back to the object over here. All right, then you don't even need to draw the normal because you know I and R is definitely correct. So even though there's no mirror in front of the object, the image will still form directly behind where the mirror is supposedly. All right, so just take note of that. I'll show, I'll illustrate an example shortly. All right, um, I have a bottle of uh, red pens mirror here all right obviously the mirror ends here i'm going to place it beyond the mirror so there's nothing actually in front of the object so when i look at it i can still see the image of the bottle of red pen there and if i point to exactly where i see it it's actually behind the mirror over here and the object distance is equal to the image distance behind so even if there's no mirror in front of the red pen here, right, the image will look like it's over here. So that's what it means. So even if there's nothing, you can still draw the image. Alright, so back again to the situation. Even if I have no mirror in front of me, like just now you just saw, alright, all you need to do is to extend this line, the mirror line, measure this distance, reproduce the same distance, object distance equals to image distance, so the image will be formed here. So if you are in a position to be able to see it, then you should be able to connect the line from the image to the eye. If you are able to do so, then actually the image can be seen. So oftentimes they will have questions like, uh, in O-level, they will ask you questions like, can, if an observer is here and the image is here, can he be seen by this fella? Then all you need to do is do the same. Produce the image. If you need to extend the mirror line, produce the image same distance image distance equals to object distance if you can form a line connecting from the image to where the eye is and it passes through the mirror then it can be seen in this case then it cannot be seen because actually the light ray for it to be able to reach this eye must actually reflect here but of course there's no mirror here lah. the mirror ends here so therefore this object cannot be seen but this object can be seen so some applications of mirrors uh, for example, we use it in vision testing. Some optometrists are uh, not the modern optometrists nowadays. Lah. Some optometrists actually make you look at the test your eyesight by asking you to look into the mirror when the sign is placed in your back. I don't know how many of you have had that experience before. But what it does is that actually because the light ray has to travel from this object here, which is the sign that you have to read, to the mirror and to the eye, therefore it seems effectively that the object is much further away than it actually is. Lah, right? So, if let's say your optometrist is constrained by space, only has this much space for him to work with, then this allows him to test your vision at a further distance. Lah. Apart from that, some instrument scales that you will encounter over the course of the next few weeks, uh, months, also as well, um, you will encounter uh, scales that have mirrors placed beneath it. So, this is a bulk meter. There will be a strip of mirror here for you to test whether you are uh, whether you are in a position that will cause you to have parallax error. So when you have a needle gauge that is me uh, needle gauge that is increasing, so when it increases, you should see the reflection will also. I mean, this will cause the needle here to have an image on the mirror strip here. All right. So if you are in a position of parallax, then actually you will be able to see both the mirror and the image. So what you're supposed to do is then adjust your head until you only see the image, the needle on top. So that is in a position where you are in. Uh, you are, don't have any parallax error. 
right? Some other examples that we use periscopes. Periscopes also use um, in periscopes in submarines also use um, mirrors because you need the light. It allows you to actually see above your eye level. Alright, so submarines while they are underwater, you can see above the sea level to see any boats on top or whatever. Alright, we're going to talk about refraction of light now. Um, refraction of light causes quite a few um, interesting effects. Um, one of them is called a uh, Feta Morgana. So I'm just going to show it here. Uh, it is what um, the Flying Dutchman or uh, all the ghost stories of ghost ships were based on. So it's basically, it looks like a floating ship now. All right, and because the light is actually bouncing off in a certain direction or changing direction, that's what it looks like. So all these floating ships that you see, all right, all these are effects due to refraction, and they are called the uh, mirages of the sea, Feta Morgana. Right, uh, in fact, some of them said are uh, said to be the origin of why uh, of the origin of the flying Dutchman or ghost ships. Uh. Right, so refraction of light essentially, okay, these are some of the learning outcomes you have to uh, learn by the end of the lesson. Alright, the reason why refraction occurs is because, is because light travels at different speeds in different medium, right? Uh, light cannot travel through all medium, but the medium that light can travel through is called a transparent medium. Right, because um, they are traveling through different mediums, the speed of light will actually change when it travels from one medium to another medium, one transparent medium to another transparent medium. All right, and this change in speed is what causes the light to bend. All right, so what exactly is refraction? Refraction is the bending of light as it passes from one optical medium to another. All right, optical medium. We, uh, we need to start using this word a lot. Huh? Uh, light travels the fastest in vacuum in fact, the speed of light in vacuum is 3 times 10 power 8 meters per second. Alright, and in any other transparent medium, it will cause the light to actually slow down. For example, glass, water, anything that allows light to travel, to light to still travel through it, will cause it to be, uh, to slow down. And all this medium, we call them uh, optically denser medium. Now, the more the light uh, the more it slows down light, the more denser it is. You cannot just use the word denser because that's an entirely different concept, right? Optical density is what we're talking about. So you must use this term properly whenever you're talking about light. All right, so again, with refraction, there are two laws as well. The first law is similar to the first law of reflection. Uh, second law uh, is slightly different but the first law of refraction states again it looks quite similar to the first law of reflection that the incident ray refracted ray and the normal all lie on the same plane only at one point and it's the point of incidence all right so I'll just show you an example of what it means uh, for it to be called the first law so let's say I have light impinging on the or hitting a certain a boundary between two mediums one of them is a optically less dense medium L another one is the optically more dense medium M all right so when this happens uh, refraction will occur lah, because the light will bend in a certain way all right and I explain why they bend in a certain way shortly lah. all right uh, the definition of angle of incidence is still the same It's between the normal and the incident ray so this is angle of incidence the light ray that goes through is called the refracted ray the angle of refraction is the angle between the normal and the refracted ray. So if you can draw this, you already know what is the first law. Because the first law states the incident ray, this one, the refracted ray, this one, and the normal, this one, all lie on the same plane, which is the boundary between the two medium, only at one point, and that point is here where it hits the surface, called the incident point. So it's called the point of incidence. Right. The second law of refraction is a little bit different. So this is something a little bit new. It states that given any two medium, so as long as the two medium doesn't change, let's say it's air and water, for as long as these two doesn't change, the ratio of the sine of the angle of incidence to the sine of the angle of refraction is always the same. That means even if I increase this angle of incidence, so the R will bend in a certain way as well, 
So this new i and this new r, if I take the sine i over the sine r of this, it will always give me the same number provided I do not change this to medium. So let's discuss why light bends as it enters. So you remember that whenever light moves from a higher optical density to a Oh no, from a lower optical density to a higher optical density. So from less dense, less optically dense to a more optically dense, it will cause it to slow down. Alright, so because of this slowing down, it will cause it to bend in a certain direction. So imagine this is a beam of light. So imagine it's traveling around the path of the incident ray here that I said. Alright, so the moment some portion of the light enters the more dense medium, more optically dense medium, this portion here will actually slow down. But because these fellas here, the rest of the light ray is actually still in the higher optical density medium, they are still moving faster. They are still moving as fast as before. Only this portion has slowed down. So if you imagine it's like a car moving, so when suddenly this wheel slows down but this wheel is still going faster, faster then it will actually cause this light ray to rotate. Alright, rotate until the point where both wheels are inside, then after that it will carry on. So whenever light travels from a less optical density, it slow a less optical dense to more optically dense, it slows down and because of the slowing down it will cause it to bend. And the bending is in this direction. Alright? So how do we describe this bending? Alright, I know you might want to say naturally is turn left or white or clockwise or anti-clockwise. Alright, so definitively we say if this was the original path of the light ray, right? This causes Whenever it goes from a less optically dense to a more optically dense, we say it will bend towards the normal. Right? That's what we call it. Now, um, the same can then be said about when light goes from a more optically dense to a less optically dense medium. So, if it's traveling more optically dense, more optically dense means it's slower than the last one. Huh? So, it's slower, 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 slower. Then suddenly, some portion is now in the faster medium. So this wheel will have a tendency to go faster while the rest is still going slower. So it enters, it's faster, so this portion will turn, then it will bend in this direction. Then once both wheels are inside, then it will carry on and move in this direction. So it actually bends in this manner. So if this was the original path of the light ray, then we say that whenever it goes from a more optically dense to a less optically dense, it will bend away from the normal. Alright? Alright, so just now we were talking about more optically dense and less optically dense medium. So is there a way for us to measure and calculate? Actually, there is. Right? And that way, or that number we use to calculate it by is called the refractive index of the medium. Now, this you need to know because this is the definition of refractive index. Now, uh, it will be natural for you later on to use another formula that is also N to calculate uh, to define refractive index, but whenever O-Level asks you about definition, this is what they are asking for. So, it's defined as the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in the medium. So, this medium here is what you are calculating the refractive index for, and then you need to know what is the speed of light in that medium. So, for example, Let's say I know, um, actually from your study of electromagnetic waves, you know that the speed of light in vacuum is 3 times 10 power 8 meter per second, right? Let's say you are able to measure the speed of light uh, as it's traveling through a certain medium, let's say water, all right? You find that it's 1.5. So 3 times 10 power 8 divided by 1.5 times 10 power 8, you've got 2. So the refractive index of water, what you calculated is 2. Now, all different mediums will have different ways or how much it slows it down by and each different medium will have a different refractive index so what about n equals to 3 what is the speed of light in the medium that of n equals to 3 then you just use n equals to c over v 3 you know that the speed of light is 3 times 10 power 8 v so v is equals to 3 times 10 power 8 over 3 the speed is 1 times 10 power 8 meter per second so the speed of light in this medium of refractive index 3 is now 1 times 10 power 8. So you see kind of like a relationship when this at refractive index is 2, it cuts down the speed by 2. Alright, so you just divide by 2. When it's n equals to 3, then it cuts it down by 3. So you just take the speed of light divided by 3. So the speed is one third of that. So after they found out this ratio of refractive index, or a way to measure the optical density of a certain medium, they discovered also that the C over V 
which is the definition of refractive index here, uh, happens to have the same number as this sine i over sine r. Alright, the one from the second law of reflection. So that's why we can also relate c over v equals to sine i over sine r is equals to n. Alright, so here are some refractive indexes. You don't need to know any of them. If they need you to, you will have to calculate. But you should know that the refractive index of vacuum is 1. Why is it 1? Because... Uh, it doesn't slow down light at all lah, when it's in a vacuum. Lah. So the refractive index is 1. Lah. You divide by 1, it is 2, 3 times 10 power 8. Lah. It doesn't slow it down. Another significant thing that you may notice is that the speed of light in air is also very close to 3 times 10 power 8. The header here has t to, uh, 10 to power 8. Lah. So 2.99 times 10 power 8 is the speed of light in air. So it's essentially the same as vacuum. So sometimes we use the term air and vacuum interchangeably. But you just must be careful when they ask you for definition of refractive index, then it's the ratio of speed of light in vacuum to speed of light in the medium. Alright, so just one more final example before I go into another set of notes. What happens if my light ray enter, enters at an angle of incidence of zero? So Remember the angle of incidence is between the incident ray and the normal. So if I'm traveling from less to more, then actually if the light ray is like this, my angle of incidence is zero. Angle of incidence is zero. So in this case, there is actually no refraction. And you can use this same example with the car just now. If the car is traveling, both wheels will enter the same the medium at the same time and slow down at the same time. So, there's no bending because they both slow down at the same time. So, uh, any light ray that enters another medium at an angle of incidence of zero uh, has no deflection. It will just go out as per normal. Alright, uh, this is from your set of summary notes. So, just take note, refraction. Uh, you can feel it along as you go if you still haven't feel it. Uh, refraction occurs due to the difference in the speed of light in different mediums. Right, so the formula for refractive index is C over V, which is also the definition, if they ask you for the definition of refractive index. And the speed of light in vacuum to the speed of light in the medium. And when you use this to calculate, this medium is what you are calculating the refractive index for. Right, so uh, while we use vacuum in the definition, just do take note that the speed of light in vacuum and the speed of light in air is about the same. So sometimes we can use those numbers uh, interchangeably. Alright, so we need to discuss a little bit about refraction uh, from a less, optical dense, less optically dense medium to a more optically dense medium. I must use the word optically. Yeah. Alright, so if it's traveling from less to more, the light ray comes, the light ray will bend towards the normal and the formula or the relationship for refractive index is given as sine i over sine r. Alright, so the other thing that I want you to take note is also that when uh, refraction occurs from a more optically dense to a less optically dense medium, that means from a more to less, as it travels here, it will bend away from the normal and actually, the formula you use instead of sine i over sine r is sine r over sine i. Now, um, just do take note that the less optical, less optically dense medium in O level syllabus is usually air or vacuum. In fact, this formula only works when it's either air or vacuum. And the less optically dense here is always either just air or vacuum. Alright? Uh, in case you are having a little bit of a brain fart during the exam and you cannot remember whether it's which formula am I supposed to use sine i over sine r or sine r over sine i, if you know which angle is the bigger one, you always put the bigger angle in the numerator. So if you look at this, this bend towards the normal, so i is bigger than your r, i appears in the numerator. In this case, it bends away from the normal, so i and r, r is bigger than my i, so r appears in the numerator. Alright, uh, to put into context of what we saw with the Feta Morgana, right? so actually because of the difference in the optical density of the air above the ship, so let's say this is the sea here, sea level, and you are standing at sea level here looking out at sea, and there's a ship out very far out onto the horizon. Um, so the light ray that is actually coming out from the sea, 
uh, from the ship is actually as it moves through the air is being refracted because of the different optical density so by the time it reaches your eye it reaches in this direction now uh, it's interesting that human beings can only process you know images uh, our brains are processed to know that light comes or comes moves in a straight line. So instead of knowing that it's here, that the light actually bends and comes here, so our brain extrapolates the line because we only know light travels in a straight line. So we extrapolate the line and where they converge is where we perceive the image of the ship to be. That's why the ship looks like it's floating above the sea. All right. So this explains all of the refraction -ish, um, phenomenon that we may see. Nah. Right, so just a little bit of an example, just to show, just to show how a sample O level question will look like. Alright, so I'll solve the question together with you. Alright, so you have a, a light ray that's being refracted to a glass surface. So air here, glass here, uh, angle of incident 60, angle of refraction 36. Uh, shows the incident ray at a different angle later on. So they ask you to calculate what is this angle of refraction. Alright, so this is a situation where light ray is traveling from a less optically dense to more optically dense. Right, I told you air is always the less one. Glass, anything else is always more. Air or vacuum is the less one. So because it's less to more, then I'm supposed to use sine I over sine R. Alright, and I know this is 60, this is 36. So I substitute sine 60 degrees over sine 36 degrees. So just be mindful uh, when you are doing, especially if you are doing A math, uh, to change the mode of your calculator to degree mode instead of radian mode. Right? I have quite a few students who say they made mistakes later on because they forgot to uh, convert it to back to degree mode. The calculator back for 2 degree mode from radian mode. So when you do this calculation, you get a value of about 1.47. So this is the refractive index. Refractive index has no units. Right, so now I know the refractive index of the glass is 1.47. Then again, it's a situation of light traveling from a less optically dense to a more optically dense medium. So I use n equals to sine i over sine r again. But I know that n is actually 1.7 now because I calculated it here. 1.47 sine i is now 30 degrees. So sine 30 degrees over sine r. Alright, so just just manipulation for your mathematical functions so bring the sine r over so sine r equals to sine 30 degrees over 1.47 so r equals to sine inverse sine 30 degrees over 1.47 and you get an answer of 20 degrees and that should be your final answer all right all right next thing we're going to talk about is total internal reflection now, total internal reflection comes about not because of reflection, uh, but because of the refraction of light. Alright, so, um, whenever, I'm not sure actually, actually whether you can see this, I'll show you a better example over here. So, you can see actually that there's a reflection of the guy's uh, hand or arm. And his arm is actually underwater here, but then you actually sort of see the reflection uh, at the surface. So it, it seems a bit confusing, there's no mirror, then how come there's reflection? Isn't light supposed to refract? Right, so we explore, we explore all of this, uh, in, this um, in this portion of uh, called TIR. Nah. Alright, so total internal reflection can only occur when light travels from an optically denser medium to an optically less dense medium. Alright, so I'll just show you how it looks like. Alright, so... You have a medium here, I have water at the top, air at the bottom, so light is trying to travel from air to, uh, sorry, water to air, so from a more optically dense to a less optically dense. So if you look at the light ray, then this is what you will expect. It comes in, this is the angle of incidence, then because of it being optically denser here, the water being, the air being, uh, no sorry, air being less dense, so that it speeds up, so you will bend away from the normal. Now. As I increase and increase the angle of incidence here in the water, you will notice that actually there will come a point in time where actually my light ray can no longer bend any further away from the normal. Because I increase the angle of incidence, it should bend away from the normal. So there will come a point in time where actually it can no longer bend away from the normal. And then at that point where it bends, it can no longer bend away from the normal. After that point, 
total internal reflection occurs. Total internal reflection because the light is totally internally, meaning from where it was, is internally reflected. So this surface here acts like a perfect mirror. So all the light is reflected back up. Alright, so there are two conditions for TIR to occur. Right, for TIR to occur, light must be traveling from an optically denser medium to an optically less dense medium. Alright, that's condition number one. Now, um, I put a star here because this question is often asked or often tested. The second condition is that the angle of incidence must be larger than the critical angle. Alright, so let's talk about option one first. Why is it not possible for light to be traveling from an optically less dense medium to an optically denser medium and have TIR occur? So, if it's traveling from an optically less dense medium to a more dense medium, then it should bend towards the normal. Alright, so as I increase the angle of incidence, as I increase the angle of incidence here, my light ray will still bend towards the normal. If I increase it even more, up until almost near the boundary surface, it will still bend towards the normal. So there will never be an instance of where the light ray cannot refract back. But in the instance where light is traveling from an optically denser medium to a less dense medium, right, there will come a point in time where actually my light ray can no longer bend any further away from the normal. Alright, so once it that point occurs and I increase my angle of incidence even more, then total internal reflection will occur. Alright, so I'm just going to use the summary notes now instead of the slides. Alright, um, two conditions for TIR to occur. It can only occur when light travels from a optically more dense medium to an optically less dense medium. Alright, it cannot occur any other way. And it occurs when the angle of incidence exceeds a certain point and that point is called a critical angle. So, um, what is exactly the critical angle? So now, just imagine I have a situation of light ray traveling from more to less. Right, so typically the light ray more to less, it will bend away from the normal. So, move here, it will bend away from the normal. So let's say I decide now to increase the angle of incidence even more. So this is the incident ray, this is the refracted ray. So if I increase the angle of incidence even more, then this fellow should move up. I increase even more, it should move up. When I increase even more, there will come a point in time where the light ray is already at the boundary between the more and less optically dense medium. So at this point, this angle here is called the critical angle. So this critical angle will result in an angle of refraction to be 90 degrees here. Now, this is a critical point. Because anything after this critical angle, from here to here, if you increase the angle of incidence, total internal reflection will occur. But from here to here, as long as the angle of incidence is less than the critical angle, normal refraction occurs and the light ray goes into the less optically dense medium and bends away from the normal. Alright, so this critical angle has a definition. It's the angle of incidence which will result in an angle of refraction equal to 90 degrees. Alright, so once I exceed my angle of incidence here, uh, I, I, my angle of incidence exceeds the critical angle, then this surface at the bottom here will act like a mirror and it will reflect all the light. Reflect. So that means your angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection now. Alright, so we can derive a relationship between um, the refractive index of a medium and the critical angle. So remember that critical angle can, I mean, TIR can only occur from more to less. So more to less, if you recall, the formula is actually sine R over sine I. So if I substitute the situation where I am at the critical point, so at the critical point, my angle of refraction is 90 degrees, and my angle of incidence here is at the critical, this angle is what we call critical angle. Alright, so now you're going to see C again. Just now C was uh, the speed of light in vacuum. Now this C in this formula is the critical angle. So sine 90 is 1. So you have the formula N equals to 1 over sine C. Which means given any refractive index, 
any known refractive index, I can calculate the critical angle that can um, that will cause TIR to occur if I know what is the medium. All right. So in general, the higher the refractive index of the medium, the lower the critical angle. That means the lower the critical angle, the higher chance of my angle of incidence exceeding the critical angle. So therefore, I have more TIR occurring. So that's why whenever you have a diamond, diamond is a relatively high refractive index material. Lah. So that means uh, when you see the sparkles from the diamond, there's a lot of TIR going on. That means light enters, it cannot escape because it's being TIR inside until the point where you angle it at a certain angle, then the light ray is able to come out. Then after that, you see that bright spark and a sparkle. That's why they say diamond sparkle. Alright. Alright, we're back to our notes. Some examples of um, the uses of TIR. Uh, your, currently, your internet is powered by optic fibers. Right, no longer using electrical signals. So, uh, optic fibers are basically just pieces of plastic. Uh, pieces of plastic with a high refractive index in the center and a low refractive index on the outside, the covering. So remember that TIR can only occur if light is traveling from a more optically dense to a less optically dense. So instead of saying el sending electrical signals, what they do is they use light to transmit signals. So they fire a beam, a short beam of light, a short burst of light, and the light as it enters, it gets stuck inside because TIR occurs. So I equals to R. So then it goes over here, it exceeds the critical angle again, then I equals to R. So it keeps on reflecting and then it gets all the way to your house lah, and you get the signal. Lah. Uh, some advantages of using this TIR in optical fibers is that actually um, it can be transferred over a longer distance. Uh, the signal is generally faster. That's why uh, we all switched over to optic fibers because essentially it's almost traveling at the speed of light. Right? Um, yeah, so those are some. And it's actually also cheaper because instead of using copper wires, you're just using plastic. Right, so that's why we use uh, TIR in all our modern internet applications now, lah. Alright, some other applications, um, binoculars that uses prism uses TIR to trap the light and expand, uh, make the image that you look at bigger. Periscopes also some use prisms. Uh, SLRs use penta prisms or just prisms uh, in your modern DSLRs cameras. Also, is used and it uses all of these uses the application of total internal reflection. Alright, the last two portions of the chapter we'll cover together. It's called Refraction by Thin Converging Lenses. Alright, um, we're going to be studying how lenses work. Alright, uh, in specific only converging lenses. Alright, so what a converging lens does is, I mean, you all know that lens is actually basically, uh, basically a piece of uh, plastic. Lah. So what a lens does is actually because of refraction, it will cause the light ray to refract a certain way as it enters and refract a certain way when it exits. So based on how the refraction is, we can actually design a certain lens in a certain way to uh, achieve certain desired outcomes, lah, what we want of it. Lah. So uh, the most prominent one, I think some of you may know, is using magnifying glass. Lah. The magnifying glass will actually, if you, I mean, maybe you were younger, you used it, you focus the sun rays to burn some ends or what. Right? So all of this is basically just lenses. Right? Um, you, there are two types of lenses, actually converging and diverging lenses. So you need to know how how a converging lens, uh, what a converging lens does to light. So converging lens will actually cause the light ray to come closer to one another and then eventually converge. While a diverging will cause the light rays to move further away from one another. Alright, so I got a simple example here. Uh, usually we represent uh, lenses with a certain arrowhead like this. Alright, so if I look at this, uh, would you say this is a diverging lens or a converging lens? Alright. Even though the light ray is actually diverging after this, after the lens, it is actually still a converging lens. Because if you look at the original path of the light ray, then the action of this lens is to actually bring them closer to one another. A diverging lens actually will cause the light ray to move in this direction. So that is a diverging lens. Now, uh, talking about converging lenses, why are we, what are we interested in to know when we're talking about converging lens? Right, so let's say I have a converging, converging lens here. 
right? And uh, don't mind the line here, it's just for uh, ease of drawing for now, right? And I have an object now in drawing of ray diagrams of lenses, the object is always most of the time drawn as an arrowhead so you can differentiate the top and the bottom. Now, the object, if it is luminous, will have light rays radiating from all sorts of direction. Uh, it will radiate into all sorts of direction. Now, only the light ray that hits the lens is what we are interested in. Because of the presence of the lens, the light ray will bend and move in a certain way because of the design of the lens. And because of the design of the lens, let's say it does converge here, so if we were then to place a screen over here, then we will have a certain image form of the object. So if I put a um, screen over here, I have an image that is formed that is like that. Now of course you can place the screen literally anywhere. Lah. If you place it here, then it will not be a clear image. Lah. You get a blurry image because you have light rays coming from the same point, but they are all hitting on different points on the screen. Lah. So it's just the same image left over different places in the screen and it will look basically like a blurry image lah. so our study of converging lens is to find out by the design of the lens what kind of image I get when I place an object at a certain place from the lens and that image will then determine what kind of application I can use it for alright so let's have a look at the lens in uh, a real life scenario alright so here I have just a normal lens alright uh, and over here I have a ring light all right, uh, which my assistant will kindly put her hand through from the bottom all right, like so so let's look at the image that will be formed here so I have the lens here and I'm moving it closer and closer and closer to the screen and you will see that eventually I'll get a nice image of the ring light uh, now can you stick in your hand? all right, she's sticking it from the bottom Right, you can see the image of a hand being formed there. Can you wave, wave? Yeah, you, even though it's at the bottom, okay, I'm going to pan and see. It's at the bottom here. You can see that the hand is actually formed at the top part of the image. So, a few things that we want to take note about the image formed by this lens. One is that uh, it's inverted, fully inverted. Uh, up is down and down is up. All right, it's definitely smaller than... Um, the reality, alright, because it's uh, I can't show you the size, lah, but it's smaller, alright. So, these are a few things that uh, we will need to be able to describe uh, of an image. So, later on, we'll go through in detail what each of these are and how we can describe them uh, fully. Now, uh, before we begin our study of the images formed by lenses, uh, we need to get familiar with some of the terms that are used in description uh, to lenses. So, the first one that I'm going to introduce is the optical center. Uh, this one is easy, it's the direct center of the lens. Alright, so wherever your lens is, the direct center is the optical center. Now, the line that runs perpendicular to the lens, but also cuts through the optical center which means this line here we give it a special name called the principal axis all right over here is the optical center now um, any light ray that comes parallel to the principal axis they will all converge onto one point that point is called the focal point over here now, the line that is parallel to the lens, but also cuts through the focal point, we call that the focal plane. All right? And I will stress on why this is important later. All right? And lastly, the one that is also quite important, the perpendicular distance from the lens to the focal plane, we call this the focal length. All right? So, there are five new terms. So I'll orientate you to how a ray diagram for a converging lens will usually look like. So the very, the very center here is the lens. The lens is, a converging lens is usually drawn as a straight line with arrowheads at both the ends. Alright, so this direct center here, this dot here, we is called the optical center. Alright, the line that is perpendicular 
and cuts perpendicular to the lens and cuts through the optical center. It's called the principal axis. Any light rays that are parallel to the principal axis, they will converge on one point. That point is called the focal point. The line that runs per parallel to the lens and but also cuts through the focal point is called the focal plane. Alright, and the last one is the distance between the lens and the focal plane. We call that the focal length. Now, what is so significant about the focal plane here? Um, one, any light rays, as long as they are parallel to one another and hit the lens, they will always converge onto the focal plane. So let's look at the red rays here. They are parallel to one another. All right, after going through the lens, they bend a different amount because of the structure and curvature of the lens, but they will always converge onto the focal plane. All right, these light rays, the blue one, they bend in a certain way based on the curvature of the lens, but they will also always merge on a different point on the focal plane. Now, this is only applicable when the light rays are parallel to one another. Then they will focus and converge onto the focal plane. Alright, so we learned five terms. The focal length, the focal point, the optical center, the principal axis, and the focal plane. And I talked about all light rays that are parallel with one another will always converge on a certain point on the focal plane. The very last point that is important for the study of converging lens is that objects that are very far away, when the light rays hit the lens, they are almost they are parallel when they reach the lens. So imagine I have an object that I place over here. The, I'm looking at the light rays that reach over on this point. So the light rays come out from this object, it will hit and my angle is as such. But if I pull the object further back, then you will see that the lines, the angle between it gets smaller and smaller. If I pull the object even further back, then the angle becomes smaller and smaller until they are almost parallel. If, I, if you imagine I pull the object even further back, then by the time the light ray hits here, it will almost be parallel. So there are seven things that you need to remember that are important. All right, The five different terms that we use to describe lenses and these two points here because this will be important for our study of uh, lenses. If you remember earlier, I mentioned that an object will radiate light rays in all directions but we are only interested in the one that reaches the lens. Because of the shape of the lens and the characteristics of the lens, it will cause it all those light rays coming out from here to converge onto a certain point. And if I place a screen here, then I will get a nice sharp image of the object being formed. Now, um, there are so many light rays. Uh, the important point is to find out where the convergence point is. Now, I don't need to know how each of them behave, but uh, to predict where the convergence point is but I can definitively tell with just two light rays now there are three light rays of which we can tell how they act when they go through a lens so I'll introduce them uh, I'll introduce these three light rays to you the first light ray is the light ray that passes through the optical center any light rays that pass through the optical center will not change direction they are undeflected so if you look at my ray A it passes through the optical center it doesn't change direction it will just move on straight move on straight now the second light ray we're talking about is the light ray b light ray pair that are, are parallel to the principal axis they will always cut through the focal point on the other side of the lens so any light ray parallel to the principal axis when it hits it will always cut through the focal point and they meet now honestly light ray a and b is sufficient for me to find the convergence point already because I only need two to be able to find out where the light rays converge. But there is another light ray that you should know how it acts when it goes through a lens. If an object is placed at a distance greater than the focal length and the light ray coming from the object passes through the focal length on this side of the lens and then hits the lens, then the light ray will then come up parallel to the principal axis. Now, these are not the only three light rays. You must remember, uh, the light rays move in all directions and all of them will converge onto one point here. Right? So, just by knowing these three and those seven points be, uh, before this, you should be able to solve any light ray questions. 
Alright guys, you should have your summary sheet here. I'll just uh, orientate you to the object. Uh, what are all the headers here? The object distance is the distance at which I place the object relative to the lens, the focal length of the lens. Now, each lens, how do I determine the focal length? Is actually by the thickness of the lens. Alright, so that's why people who need a, whose eyesight is bad, bad, they need quite a big uh, thick lens for them to correct their image, uh, correct their eyesight. Alright, so um, how to determine the focal length is by design. So we design them so that the focal length will change. Alright, so object distance, I'm just going to give it a symbol here, U. Image distance is V. The distance from the image to the lens is V. The distance from the object to the lens is U. Alright, so based on where I place my object relative to the focal length, I will have different type of images form. And the different type of image form will then determine what kind of application I'm going to use it for. Alright, so I'm going to start off with um, a little bit of a simple one here. When an object is placed between F and 2F. So let's recall what are the three light rays that you need to draw that you can predict. So the first light ray that you can predict is the light ray that cuts through the optical center. So I just draw a light ray from here down through the optical center. All right. And then remember to put your arrowhead before and after. All right. The next light ray that I can predict is the one that is parallel to the principal axis. The one that is parallel to the principal axis will always cut through the focal length on this side of the object. On the other side of the lens, sorry, that's what I meant. So wherever they converge is where all the light rays will converge. So once I draw it nicely, I have the convergence point here. This is where the image of the top of the arrow will form. So then I can just draw the image. Alright, so the image is formed here on this side of the lens, on the opposite side of the lens. So there are a few things that we can use to describe this lens, uh, the image form. One, we can tell that it's inverted. It's upside down, just now like the example I showed you. It is magnified, meaning it is bigger. How do I know that it's bigger? I just compare this size, the object, or original object plus the image. The image is clearly bigger, so it's magnified. All right, real, because the light rays actually meet here and converge. If I were to place a screen here, because the light ray actually converts here, I will get a nice image being formed here. Just like how you see it in the example just now. Alright, so what are the descriptors for the image distance? Um, the image is formed always at a greater dis distance greater than 2F. But I have 2F on both sides of the lens because, well, you can flip a lens the other way and it will still work. Lah. So... To be definitively clear, you need to tell me it's on the opposite side of the lens. Alright, so what kind of um, uses or application for this kind of orientation where I place the object at a distance between F and 2F and I form an image that is real but bigger. So in terms of the, I always tell my students to think about it in terms of the school context. So um, this one is the projector you have in class. So the image formed behind the lens of a projector, all right, will be a tiny image of what you see on the laptop that the teachers will uh, show la, on, their, on the teacher's laptop. So at the front here, you should have a lens. So the image will then be formed onto a projector screen and the image will become very, very big. That's why you can see. So the image is, uh, the original object is very small. It's contained within the projector itself. The light source but the image that is formed is huge magnified so in terms of the context projector all right the next one i want to do is when i place an object exactly at 2f so when i place an object exactly at the position of two times the focal length i do all the same steps i draw the light ray that cuts through the optical center it's undeflected All right, cuts through the principal axis, cuts through the focal length, uh, focal point. You will see that the convergent point 
point is actually at 2F and the image is formed like that. Alright, don't forget your arrow heads because if not, your minus marks. So, what you see is actually the image is inverted. It is real because the light rays actually converge here. And if you were to take a ruler and measure this and compare with this, you will realize that it's actually the same size. Where the image forms, it forms exactly at 2F on the opposite side of lens. So in terms of the school context, I say try to think of applications in terms of the school context. What is an application where I put an object, go through a lens, and form an image of the exact same size. All right, It is a photocopier. Now, I'm going to run through the same steps for the rest. It's just that I place the object at different positions and we'll see what kind of image I get. Alright, I want to save a little bit of time. I think the video is running a bit raw, uh, long, so I will just cut when I've completed it. So I've gone ahead and done the next one, which is when an object is placed at a distance greater than two times the focal length. I did the, I mean, one, two of the three light rays. I only need two to find the convergence point. Where they converge, I drew the uh, image, and the image is, it, since it uh, converges, so it's inverted real. If you take a ruler and measure the size and compare this is the image form is actually smaller than the object so we call this diminish all right so again uh, the image is formed at a distance between f and 2f on the opposite side i won't write this anymore all right opposite side of lens and in terms of application what kind of application i have an object that is so big but the image form is much smaller than um, it actually is. So the two applications are actually cameras and eye. So imagine you are taking a picture of someone that is so tall, one, 1.8 meters tall. Right? The image of the person form is very small. It can fit into the camera. Right? In those uh, old films, your Polaroid films, it can, fill, it can um, just fit the size of your Polaroid. So this is a case of a real image being formed that is diminished. Alright, your eyes work the same way. Alright, light rays from him. Uh, the guy is so big, 1.8 meters, but it forms in a small image at the back of your eyeball. Alright, so um, those people who have a need to wear glasses, what happens is that actually your eye, by right, the light rays should form nicely and converge nicely at a certain point at the back of the eyeball. But for the people who have some issues with their eyesight actually the light rays do not converge nicely so this imagine these two light rays are coming from the same object from the top let's say the top of the head of uh, a person All right when it hits by right because of the eyeball the light ray is supposed to converge nicely and hit at the same point just at the where it hits the back of the eyeball where the nerve clusters are so sometimes they don't hit nicely that's why they get blurry image so what people do is they then put a lens in front here to change the direction of the light ray before it enters the eye so that after it does its refraction through the eye, it will meet just nicely here and form a nice image. Alright, so people wear spectacles, they wear contact lenses, some people do corrective surgery, LASIK to change the shape of their eyeball a little bit so that it can meet and form a nice image. So that's how all this uh, surgery works. Alright, so I am now going to move on and do you and an object is placed at a distance less than the focal length. Uh, once I finish it, I will carry on the video. Alright, let's examine the situation when an object is placed at a distance less than 2F to the lens. Alright, so I've gone on and done whatever we did. Draw two of the three light rays. I drew the one that cuts through the optical center. It's undeflected. I drew the one that is parallel to the principal axis. It's supposed to cut through the focal length. And then I realized that actually, A, the light ray never converged. So whenever the light ray doesn't converge, what you do then is you trace it backwards. Alright, I'll do the same with the other one. I'll trace it backwards. Alright, so wherever the converges on that side, you will form an image here. Alright, so now this virtual is uh, this image is a virtual image 
is up right remember the light rays are coming up from the top so it will form the corresponding same image point on the top and it is magnified because it is bigger now this may seem a little bit confusing uh, until I give you the example uh, so I give you the descriptors where the descriptors is that it's formed behind the object and it's on the same side of the lens previously all the images were formed on the other side of the lens right this application is actually the magnifying glass so if you have to look at it imagine you are the observer here you are looking at an object so let's say I'm trying to look at the word upright here so the word upright here is on the opposite side on the other side of the lens and I see the image form on the other side of the lens as well and it appears bigger when I'm looking at it from this side of the lens all right um, because the light rays change direction because of the presence of the lens and it reaches my eye remember that my brain can only interpret light as coming as moving in a straight line so my brain interprets that the image that the light source is actually or rather the light rays are coming actually coming from here so that's why I form my brain forms the image that it uh, the perception that the image is here so if I look at the word description all right so let me just bring it up here you will see that actually the word description is much bigger when I view it through the magnifying glass and then it looks a little bit further so this is the situation of a magnifying glass now two unique situations that appear then what happens if I place an object exactly at the focal length when I place an object exactly at the focal length I did exactly what I usually do find the two rays draw the ray that cuts through the optical center it is undeflected the parallel one go through the focal length I realize that they are never going to meet because they are parallel so whenever they don't meet you are supposed to trace it backwards lah. so you just do the trace backwards all right uh, this one you may need to do a little bit of memorization you must remember they are upright virtual and magnify the image form because um, this is a bit of a mathematical concept when we say there are parallel light rays the image or rather the parallel rays will eventually meet at infinity so the image will form at infinity all right and it forms on the same side of the lens so some examples of what this is your spotlight in your theater all right you have the spotlight actually comes originates from one light source it goes through a big lens cap and then after that it comes out all parallel right uh, I drew a Batman here because you know, the Batman spotlight works the same lah. all right and the very very last unique situation is when an object comes in from infinity it means the object is so, so far away there is an infinity if you remember point number seven when an object is super far away the light rays come and hit the lens almost in a parallel fashion so in this case I decided to draw the one that cuts through the focal length first and then hit the lens so that one you know it will come out and be parallel to the principal axis I forgot the arrow hit here all right so because you know that the object is far away you know that the light ray will come in parallel to this light ray because light rays they are far come from objects that are far away are parallel so I just drew a parallel light ray that happens to pass through, pass through the optical center because well it's undeflected like easy lah. so I just drew so where they converge that's where the image will form now usually these are things that we talk about like we are looking at planets looking at the Sun looking at the moon objects that are super far away all right so the image form is inverted real and diminished all right the image is formed directly at the focal length and on the opposite side of the lens from the where the light ray is coming from or where the object is all right the applications of this is a bit out there it's the objective lens or the object lens of a telescope now you look at all these different things all the way from an object is placed really close then at f then an object is placed between f and 2f object placed at 2f object placed at greater than 2f and finally an object that is super far away and there's so many different applications how are you supposed to memorize all of this all right i usually don't lah. all right so what i usually do is i brute force it and just roughly try and guess and figure it out so let's say you are given the task to find uh, describe the image form of an object place at the distance between uh, greater than 2f sorry at a distance greater than 2f so what I usually do is I will just draw the lens, I'll draw the principal axis then I like roughly use my finger to estimate focal length lah. doesn't matter lah because they ask me what is the focal length so I just 
they didn't give me the focal length so I just roughly estimate lah. but of course the question gives you certain measurement you need to follow lah. so I use my thumb F to F F to F so an object that is placed greater than 2F I just draw the object there then I just do the same that as what you have been doing for the last six occasions just draw the light ray that is undeflected cut through the optical center the light ray actually honestly I maybe don't even need a ruler just estimating anyway Right, then you realize that actually the image will form over here. So even me not drawing it very nicely, I know the image is inverted, real, and diminished, which is exactly what we did. 2f greater than 2f, inverted, real, and diminished. All right, so you just need to sort of roughly know. Now the interplay between all of these or the difficulty in all of this is that basically in any ray diagram question involving lens. There's always the lens and of course the associated focal length. There's always a certain object. There's always a certain image. So you usually they give you focal length and object as you find image. Lah. But in theory, they can ask you object, image, find focal length. So they only need to give you two out of the three. You are supposed to be able to figure out the other one. So if I give you an example of, let's say I have a lens. I have a certain object. I have a certain image here. Can you find where is the focal length? So, of course, I just draw this one because I know, I know it's supposed to hit the one that cuts through the optical center is undeflected. Then I know that the parallel to the principal axis is here. Then I just know that the light ray is supposed then to hit again over here, cuts through somewhere and hits over here, and the way it cuts through is the focal length. So it, if it's drawn to scale, then you already have the answer for the focal length. All right. Another example, they can give you focal length and image that ask you find the object is also possible. So you just need to kind of work backwards to find the answer. Alright, so I think that comes brings us to the end of uh, the chapter of light. I know it's super long. It's going to be a super long video. Uh, I'll put the timestamps at the bottom so you can click to wherever you need help with. Alright, bye-bye.